Madam uh, President, forgive me. <laughs> senator from Delaware. Madam President, I'd like to thank uh, my great colleague, uh, the Senator from Rhode Island, for his tireless efforts to keep climate change on this chamber's radar. One day, I hope that we can move it from our radar to our to-do list and ultimately to the history books. Uh, today, I'm uh, pleased and proud to join uh, my colleagues here to talk about something I thought we'd established in grade school, but apparently bears repeating. That is the importance of science. It is troubling that today in the 21st century, there is any doubt about the importance of real sound science in many facets of our lives. It's troubling we still need to defend science here on the Senate floor. Scientific discovery and invention is the engine of our economy. Science leads to transformative technologies and new ways of thinking in a wide range of fields, healthcare, manufacturing, agriculture, clean energy, and national security. Scientific inquiry is also the foundation of good public policy. It shapes and informs how we address global threats, such as ozone depletion, an issue on which the international community has made real progress. Science must play an equally central role in how we address climate change. When we want to know what to do about a public health or an environmental crisis, we turn to science. For example, rigorous, careful data collection and analysis is critical to understanding long-term trends. Data can show the effectiveness of a medication in treating a disease, for example, or the ability of a new material to withstand extreme conditions over time. And data can help us to make good decisions based on those trends. Never have we had a greater ability to collect and analyze data than today. That's why more than ever in today's world, science should drive policy, not the other way around. In a number of areas, I've worked with my Republican colleagues on bipartisan bills that help substantially advance scientific inquiry, from encouraging citizen science projects to improving public-private partnerships with our national labs. So why is climate science so threatening to some? Sadly, there are far too many organizations in existence today that have it backwards. These organizations have attempted to distort science for purely political ends, because the facts threaten the bottom line of those who have created and sustained them. These organizations claim to use sound science to support policy objectives, but their actions indicate that the only science they find sound is the kind that sounds like profits. One of these organizations is the now defunct Advancement of Sound Science Coalition, known as the TASC, an organization that played a key role in obscuring the facts around the dangers of tobacco use. TASC was originally founded back in 1993 under the guise of promoting, quote, sound science in policy making. In reality, as was later uncovered in uh, the documents that came to light as uh, in the course of uh, litigation against the tobacco industry, TASC actually had the opposite goal. The year it was founded, it stated in private documents at the time that one of its goals was to lay the groundwork to help Phyllis, Philip Morris advance its agenda of promoting tobacco use nationally and at the state and local level. How? By, and I quote from one of these discovered documents, encouraging the public to question from the grassroots up the validity of scientific studies, unquote. These are not the statements of an organization devoted to scientific inquiry and data-driven policy. Let me be clear, the problem doesn't lie in industry hiring scientists to argue their, their case. That's well within the rights of industry and of any organization in our country. The problem is when groups like this one misrepresent their very motives, hide their sources of funding and industry ties, and push out misleading or even incorrect information under the guise of sound science. We all know today that smoking tobacco is harmful to our health, profoundly harmful to our health. Yet these same organizations, the ones that decades ago promoted science that hid the truth about tobacco and threatened public health for far too long, are now, in sadly too many cases, doing the same with climate change. Fortunately, today, this group I'm discussing, TASC, is now defunct. But its former executive director, Steve Malloy, is still an active climate change denier and editor of JunkScience.com. In fact, Malloy was one of those who helped draft the 1998 Global Climate Science Communications Action Plan. It included the statement, quote, victory will be achieved when average citizens understand the uncertainties in climate science. Recognition of uncertainties becomes part of the conventional wisdom, unquote. Quite simply, his goal was and continues to be to persuade people using incorrect, scientifically unsound information to doubt the science about climate change, one of the greatest global challenges we face. His policy goal is to halt action on climate change and he's using science incorrectly to achieve this political end. 
Frankly, this is irresponsible, and it flies in the face of the foundation of the scientific method. As someone who trained in chemistry in college, I am familiar with how scientists are trained to formulate hypotheses, carefully construct experiments to test those hypotheses, and without bias or preformed assumptions, then draw conclusions about those hypotheses. Starting with the answer and only considering evidence that supports that answer, that's not science, that's politics. Madam President, the very existence of groups like TASC and others that my colleagues will speak about this evening and tomorrow make clear that we must work even harder to defend and support science throughout our society. That means providing robust funding for our national lab system. That means establishing a federal effort to coordinate research in a new subfield of chemistry that I've been excited about promoting. That means supporting the use of crowdsourcing and citizen science methods in federal agencies. That means supporting policies that will support industry-relevant training and engineering, including advanced manufacturing. All of these are efforts that I've been involved in and that enjoy bipartisan support. My colleagues know that I make an effort to promote pragmatic, bipartisan policy ideas. Science should not be a partisan issue, and neither, frankly, should climate change. Climate change is all too real for those of us who live in low-lying coastal states like my home state of Delaware where flooding has already devastated homes and communities up and down the state. The science is clear. This severe flooding is only going to increase as temperatures continue to rise around the globe and as the sea level rises as well. Madam President, we live in an era of unprecedented scientific and technological advances. The NASA Juno, the NASA Juno spacecraft mission to Jupiter, the ability to use 3D printing to manufacture custom products, specifically prosthetics, the evolution of new developments in robotics and genomics. These advances capture our imagination and can change our world. These developments happen because America's best trained scientists and engineers have spent decades undertaking rigorous and innovative research and applying their findings to address the big questions of our world. Certainly the challenges of climate change are daunting and urgent, and so we should be focused on using the best science available to tackle these challenges with the best policy solutions possible not by convincing people who prefer denial and deception that the science isn't even real. Madam President, I want to thank my friend and colleague, Senator Whitehouse, for his tireless leadership in addressing climate change and for assembling today's important colloquy. And if I might, with the forbearance of my colleague from New Mexico, whom I see has come to the floor, I'd like to take just a few more minutes and address an unrelated but an urgent topic. 